excellent. I'm glad you're awake. If you weren't, worship right before that probably helped. But uh, it's, it's a great morning to be together. Again, my name's Jesse, if we haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet. And uh, we believe that God is up to something good here at Life Center Rainier. How many of you agree with that statement? Yeah. Amen. And, and we've been in a collection of conversations called The Invitation. And, and we've talked about and discussed the invitation that Jesus so graciously extends to us to go on a journey with him. You know, the, the, the first step of this element is understanding God so loved the earth, the whole world. And he gave. He gave his only son that whoever believed in him wouldn't perish but have eternal life, right? John 3.16, if you've ever watched a football game, right? Or remember Tim Tebow. And... And what we know about this great extension of generosity is comes by way of reciprocation. We do nothing. Everything that we do is just a response to all that God has already done. And so as he extends so graciously, we come and follow him. He says, come, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And so we talked about that. We journeyed through that concept, and we've even touched on some different things that happen along the way. You know, Jesus takes us as we are, but he never leaves us that way. When we go on a journey with him, he says, whoever you are, wherever you are, come with me. And as we go with him, he says, don't worry about perfection. I've got that covered. He says, this is a journey of progress. And as we continue to progressively follow Jesus, we start to look more like Jesus. Amen? And so last week we talked a little bit about unforgiveness and forgiveness and the things that hold us back from getting to that place. And uh, I think we can all resonate with that idea. And this weekend we're engaging in a conversation which I will call uh, intentional reconciliation. And so as you may see, there's some chairs up here. We're going to do a little bit different of a format, if you will. And some of you are like, well, I came to hear preaching. Oh, you're going to hear some preaching. Well, how can I, I can't learn like that. How am I supposed to learn? Well, there's an old adage that says when the student is ready, the teacher can arrive. And I can learn from anyone, anywhere. How about you? And we don't want to ever be married to a method when God is speaking through various means. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to invite some friends up on stage. These are people that you're going to see here every week with their face in this place. And so these aren't uh, experts that we went out and got. What we did is that we said the answer is sitting right in our seats. And so we started to have some candid conversations. And we want to really welcome you into a discussion that we really believe will afford us a new lens on life because the Bible talks about how God's ways are above our ways. And there's a beauty in his expression of all of his creation. And we're going to lean into a conversation. And we say it's about intentional reconciliation. But really the entry point to getting to a place of reconciliation is to touch on the matter of race. And so I want to welcome up some friends today and uh, I'll, uh, yeah, please come on and join us this morning. Can you applaud and thank Jesus for the gift of these friends as they come up this morning and join us in a candid conversation? And uh, we're just leaning in, believing that the Holy Spirit will continue to speak as He has at the previous gatherings. And uh, this has been a really incredible time because I think it's creating um, opportunities for us to really start to listen and learn to a different degree. And uh, I'll say it like this. this. This conversation in particular oftentimes can, can be perceived to be uh, a tentious one. There, there can be a little bit, you know, this is intense. Well, I went camping once, and that was intense too, but that's different. And uh, thank you, thank you for somebody. Dear Lord, help us. So everybody go like this. Breathe in and breathe out. Whew. Excellent. The greatest movie of all time is Remember the Titans. Come fight me. Finding Nemo. And I remember in this incredible movie, there was an actor that I have often been mistaken for named Denzel Washington. (laughs) And he was the new coach, newly appointed coach, of a, of a team, and, and in this time, it was a very heightened racial tension 
in America, and he was a newly appointed coach that replaced a white coach, and as an African-American man was the new coach, and he kept the previous coach, and he put him as a defensive coordinator, and, and the defensive coordinator kept saying, do this, do this, do that, and at one point, Denzel said this, how smooth is Denzel? He said, you're overcooking my grits, coach, <laughs> which means he was, he was kind of getting a little, a little too much, right? He was kind of invading, getting a little obtrusive, and I want to ask your permission to overcook your grits today. <laughs> is that Okay. What we want to do is be graciously obtrusive because Jesus engaged with conversations that were countercultural to the status quo and the norm. And I believe as the church goes, so the world will go. And so we're going to lean in and lead in this area of discussion. And I just believe um, no matter where you are on the spectrum of why are we having this conversation again to you didn't say enough. I just want to preface really well. We are weighing into this, starting a conversation. This is not, we're not fixing everything today, friends, but we're here to learn how to fight mm. and to fight the way God has called us to fight. And so we want to lead in with great anticipation and great belief. So I invite you Lean in. Let's have a great conversation. And again, we have these friends that have so courageously come forward to, to help us cultivate and create a, a conversation. And so what I would do is I would ask you, take 30 seconds, if you will, 27, if you do, you know, and uh, tell everybody your name. And then tell us, really, because the conversation is, is, is tied to uh, reconciliation. But re- really, remember, we have to come back to this place of understanding who we are and how we play a part in this thing. So tell me about who you are, where, where you grew up, kind of your church background. Did you grow up in an a, a, a African-American church? Did you grow up in a primarily Caucasian church? Did you grow up in a different context? Tell me your name. Tell me your background as far as church goes, and then just say hi. Hey, friends. My name is Josie. I'm born and raised right here in Tacoma. Uh, kind of spent my whole life in church. Uh, I actually grew up in a predominantly Samoan uh, church. I am part Samoan and a little bit of Hawaiian in my blood. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I grew up in a Samoan church uh, kind of every morning, every Sunday morning, wake up, go to church. And uh, surely enough, I just kind of felt myself in a, in a weird season of life where I didn't really fully understand my identity. It wasn't until I kind of branched out and uh, found Life Center. I've uh, been a part of the Life Center family about six years now and kind of just God just really enveloped me, and uh, uh, my family was uh, kind of changed by the uh, invitation. An invitation, my grandfather kind of said yes. He said yes to Jesus, and it kind of changed the trajectory of my family. So here I am today because of the blood and the, and the work from, you know, just my family growing up. So, yeah. Awesome. Yes, absolutely. Good morning, friends. My name is Toya. I am from Spartanburg, South Carolina, born and raised. Uh, The Air Force brought me out here. Praise God for the Air Force. Um, I grew up in a black church, all black, okay, just all black. I grew up Baptist, uh, where I went to church with my grandma, my great grandma, and I sat on the front row, and I was always in vacation Bible school, and I was always in Sunday school, and you sat on the front row, and you didn't talk, you didn't eat, you just people looked at you basically. And so that was my background growing up. Um, I got stationed overseas in England. I had that encounter that we all have had. And if you haven't, I pray that you do with Jesus and changed my life and here I am today. Good morning friends, my name is Berryman and I was raised in a black church in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, We sit on the front pro front row, um, we played in the balcony, you know, church was our play field. We, I mean, in the Baptist church, you sit on the front row, you don't say anything, you know, but you listen. You know, the urchins in the church will direct you what you should be doing when, you, when you're doing something that you know you shouldn't be doing. But it was, it was a great uh, experience, you know, but and then we moved here, visit my mother-in-law, and decided to stay here. Been at Life Center now 19 years. Hello everyone, I'm Sammy Seha. Um, I actually was born in Mexico and my family settled here 
in Roy. So I actually grew up in Roy. Uh, whenever we wanted to go into the city, we would go into Yelm. And so that's kind of my... That's the booming my, metropolitan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the city. And we called it the city, you know. Um, I actually uh, grew up Catholic, so... It, it wasn't until I was 19 years old that I had a supernatural encounter with God. And it was actually here at Life Center. It was actually the Spanish-speaking uh, campus at Central. So I've always attended a Spanish-speaking church, even though English is my first language. So, and now I pastor the Spanish uh, congregation here at Life Center Rainier. So interesting story. So that's my background. I'm your brother, Bill. Yeah. Hey, James. <laughs> Again, born in San Diego. Raised, as my sister say, I've been raised, I was raised in the South. Every summer, my, my mother would send us to either the sharecropper on her side or the dairy farmer on the other side. So I didn't lose out there. I grew up learning everything about other people and other things. What I learned most of all was there was a God. Those were the same grandparents ushered us into church. I've always wanted to say this statement, now I'm going to say it. I was drugged. <laughs> I was drugged to everything the church did. They drugged me in the morning. They drugged me in the noonday prayer. They, they drugged me to Sunday school. They drugged me to YPWW. BB. I was drugged. But again, I thank God for that. Because it's that that got me here today with the mind frame and the state of mind I'm in now. It was that that taught me that there was a God that loved me back then and continues to love me now. Saved by his grace. Awesome. Um, well, my name is Marquis Makeupson, and I grew up in a predominantly black church. Um, I don't know if it was Baptist or this or that. I just knew that it was long and loud. We love the Baptists. <laughs> hey! <laughs> I just know it was long and loud. And, um, and then uh, we moved out to Spanaway, checked out a few different churches, and then uh, we showed up to um, this place um, 13 years ago. And we were just looking for um, a church to call home. And we, we sat in these seats and we felt more welcomed here than anywhere else. Um, and my dad, you know, looked around and, you know, we went from predominantly black church to predominantly white church. And, and but my dad said, I don't care who's sitting next to me, is God here? You know, and, and God was here. And so we said, this is our new home. Beautiful. Excellent, thank you. I have a few Bible verses that I just want to help us shape this conversation around. And so the first one is in Genesis. Genesis is the beginning, right? And uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 says it like this. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. And so what we come to understand is that God is the originator, the creator and that he created humanity. He created us in his like image. So we're all image bearers of God, but the expression of the outward expression of what we look like obviously is the beauty and the distinctness in how he's created each and every one of us. So we're not limited to this certain uh, uh, viewpoint. We're, we're afforded many viewpoints. I even think about God's miracle as, as, as we've heard about Noah and his ark and he gave a reminder of a rainbow, many colors. And, and this conversation isn't a skin issue, it's a sin issue mm. that we want to lean into and understand that we're all image bearers of God and created in the like image of God, but yet distinctly and uniquely made. And just because the melatonin in my skin is different than the melatonin. 99.5% of our DNA is the very same thing. But yet the outward is really the thing that we look at so often. And so God created us, image bearers of God. And then we come to this place where sin came in, which brought separation, separation from God and division within us as humanity, right? And so 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. So when we say yes to Jesus and come back to, to God through the reconciliation of the cross, he says we're ambassadors for Christ, making God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled with God. 
So because of this sin, sin is separator, separates us from the creator. He sent his son Jesus to reconcile us back to him. So now we have this reconciliation vertically, but are we limited vertically? No, he's called us to love and go horizontally and reconcile with each other. And so now we have this life of creation, image bearers, distance, separation, reconciliation, and now the ability for us to be those that would reconcile with others. Mm -hmm. He calls us peacemakers, right? Not peacekeepers. Peacekeepers tiptoe around the problem. Peacemakers engage in the, mis- in the mess and go, hey, we got to make this right. So here we are sitting here today having this discussion Galatians 3, 28 says, there's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you all, everybody say all, 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 one in Christ Jesus. That key word, all, really is what we want to engage in today. And I have one straight to the point point that I would implore you, write this down if you would. This is the big idea. Since all are created in God's image, There is no room for racism in the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so that's that's the framework in which we hope to help create some functional dialogue. And as we've journeyed, we've done this talk a few times, and it's it's been very beneficial. And uh, we just believe that this is how God is going to continue to lead us in this life, that we would have willingness to have a dialogue. Have a conversation. Lean in with, with, without a response already in mind, but lean in to learn. And so that's what we're hoping to help today. And so we've got some questions that we want to bring to the conversations. And so I'm going to just kind of shoot out some of these questions, and hopefully you have something to say on it. And if you don't, we're just going to all sit here and look at you. But let me start with this, that word all. When scripture says all were created in the image of God, what does that speak to you personally? Why is that all idea so very, very important? Bill, would you weigh in on that one for me? All right. I want you to say the word all. All. No, 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 you didn't. You didn't. I want this section to say all. All. I want this section to say all. I want this section to say all. I want that section to say all. All. Now, I said it, you said it. What you said means more when you say it and you hear it in your ear, it gets inside of you. For you to say it. So now it resonates in you. All. The word all. So when God says all, you'll go home now and say what? All. All are in the image of God. Not one, two, three, this one, that one, all. And in that imagery, he's designed you to become his son. Or as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become his son, children of God. As his child, there's a responsibility. Jesus emphasized that, exercised that, and shared that with you. You must do the same. So as God's child, wherever you go, whenever you go in any place, you are representing who? Everywhere you go. So all means all that have received him, yeah. to them gave he the power yeah. to influence, infect, and make change Beautiful. in any area you go in. Yeah. Receive that and go with that. Yes, absolutely. Awesome. Second question is this. With that framework... Why is it so important for us to sit Mm. and to understand and to listen to someone else's story that might look like or sound like or grew up different than us? Why why does that change things? Why do we need to do this? Toya, would you you weigh in on this? Yes. Good morning, friends. Good morning. Um, Really quick, between the change out of the services, I left out and I came back in and a friend said, oh... You're the coffee lady. And I said, no. (laughs) She said, oh, you're not the coffee lady? Okay, well, the coffee lady gives really good hugs. And the coffee lady's now laughing out loud. Um, So 
to, to answer the question, so I wanted to share that because we've been doing this panel. Oh, you guys are looking at me like, oh, yeah, it really happened. Um, we've been doing this panel since last night, and then to have that encounter today is why it's so important to have this conversation. Right. So why is it important to know my story based on your background, my background, your family system, the things that you were taught, the things that you see on TV, the things that society has fed into you? You might have a belief system that someone like me is different, right? We've all encountered people of our own race that have had bad behavior, right? But that doesn't mean we judge them based upon the whole race based upon that person's bad behavior. Yeah. So what I like to say and what I believe to be so is that once you sit down and you know my story and you know my background and you know why I'm loud during worship service mm -hmm. and you know why I cry during worship service mm -hmm. and why I'm so honored to be a part of this church would blow your mind. Mm. Um, I grew up again in the South and I said this last night and I'll say it again this morning. Sunday morning is the most segregated time in America. While we all believe in one Jesus Christ, right, that he died for our sins and rose again in three days, but we, we celebrate him in our black church, in our Samoan church, in our Hawaiian church, in our Hispanic church, in our white churches, but we say we believe in the same God. Right. So it's time to sit down and understand, yeah, we don't have time. I'm a vanilla latte girl if you wanna make time to know my story. But, uh, so you are the coffee girl. Amen. I am. Praise God. I, I am the coffee lady. <laughs> Praise God. Uh, but it's, you know, if you have the time, I encourage you to sit down and learn someone's story that looks different than you. Absolutely. And then take the time to ask someone that looks different than you to come out to this church. because It's an amazing place to worship. I love it. Thank you. So, so let me, because, because. A lot, of, a lot of friends would, would flippantly disregard the concept of racism. I'm not racist, I have a black friend, right? <laughs> or, or, or maybe even the position sometimes is like, um, th th this is no longer an issue. This was, you know, 1863, you know, that was taken care of, the 60s, we, we, we've, you know, we've engaged, why are we talking about this again? And, and or, it's not my issue. What, what do we need to hear, understand, and embrace to be advocates, have better understanding? What can we do as, as we, we say people of color or non-color, which I, I, I struggle with because it's just, again, the different pigmentation. We're all people of color. But, but I don't ever want to take away the beauty of the distinctness of who you are in the image of God, the Imago Dei. But, but what does that look like? How do we need to hear and understand and embrace the friends? Why would you say to them why they need to be in this conversation? Marquis. Sure. Um, I think, first off, if, you have, if you're that person that says, I have one black friend, uh, you might want to go and get another one. Um, <laughs> or Samoa. Jesus sent them out two by two, so, yeah, you know. That's what I'm saying, I'm saying. Um, because I think there's a lot of perspective that can be shared, um, and it's not just in that one person. Um, you know, you may take um, Brother Bill um, and be completely different than another um, black person that you might come across. And um, I think for those people who say that racism is done, it's already been dealt with, um, we can move on, you guys need to move on, uh, I would say that it's important to realize that whatever perspective you're on, it's supported. It's supported through your own media, it's supported through um, Facebook posts, it's supported through um, your own friend group. So I, I want you to understand that the perspective that you have is supported, but it's not just about whose perspective is supported. Um, I, I referenced um, my marriage. In my marriage, I was taught that there's this thing called facts over feelings, mm -hmm. right? Where someone's right and me and my wife could be having a conversation and I'm right or she's right or I'm wrong and she's wrong. Um, and yet at the same time, I had to realize that as a husband, it doesn't matter whether I'm right, if her feelings are hurt, her feelings are hurt, right? right? Mm -hmm. So if, the facts aside, if there's feelings hurt, there needs to be some kind of redemption from that. There, there has to be something that is done in place of that. 
Um, and so I would say for the people who say, you know, it's no longer conversation, I would say sit down and understand someone's story um, because it may be over for you, but doesn't mean it's over for someone else. Um, and so facts over feelings, make sure you care for people's feelings over maybe Excellent. what the facts that you've supported yourself. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I heard a, a, a author recently, Malcolm Gladwell, um, he's part African American and uh, he said, you know, in this season, it, it seems a little more dangerous because it's not overt, it's covert. Mm -hmm. sure. That there, less people are, are vocal about their bigotry and racism, but it's more underlying the apartment building owner won't rent to mm -hmm. multicultural friends. Mm -hmm. So let me say it like this. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King said it like this, you can't thingify anyone without dehumanizing them. Mm. How have you experienced this injustice and sin of racism in your world? Anyone want to weigh in? I shared earlier today, this morning, events with me, which was very damaging then resolved now. As a child, my father was, had a very affluent position. As a psychoanalyst, he did much of the work in California. Well, his colleagues, of course, 95% 90, of them was Caucasians. So when we go to meetings or different things with my dad, they would look at me and say, oh, tell me, not my father, but tell me, your dad is just a white man in black skin. How do you think that word in a young mind influenced it? It was infectious. It had long-term ramifications. Thank God for his healing power. Thank God for his wisdom and understanding. Some of you are sitting here. You've made statements or making statements, living out statements, walking out a lifestyle. That's just as infectious, infectious, rather, if it's not in him. You're only going to get it right in the body of Christ. Right. Outside of the body, I don't expect you to get it right. right. Inside the body, you can get it right. right. You have the ability and the acquisition to do it. Yeah. You can acquire it from him. Yeah. So that's one of the events you got to be careful about. Yeah, very good. Anybody else care to weigh in on that? That's kind of the hot one, yeah. Um, I would say specifically in, in my case, um, I, I had a couple of instances, you know, um, uh, and for me it was, it was language based, you know, don't come here talking that Mexican talk. And so I think from early on I was trained, you know, that I shouldn't speak Spanish like openly. So I kind of I kind of hid that, you know, and, and just it was the nature of the culture that I grew up in. And so that's why I feel that English has always been my predominant language. And now I'm thinking back, I'm like, okay, because uh, I was corrected so many times whenever I was in groups, and um, that that I shouldn't I shouldn't speak that, and so um, so that was my my experience, and so it was more based on the language. Mm -hmm. so. What what would you say bothers you the most about the sin of racism? As a multi ethnic friend, what would you say bothers you the most, and what would you want friends to know about this? Josie, will you, will you weigh in on this? <clears throat> yeah, for sure. I think labels. I think sometimes we can um, give people labels based on the color of our skin. I think Jesus tells us in, in John, they will know that you're my disciples by the way that you love one another. And, and sometimes when we give people labels based on the color of their skin, you've already given yourself permission not to love that person. Right because you've given them that label. And so what I'm reminded about and what Paul is telling us in 2 Corinthians is each and every one of us have a part of the body. Each and every one of us has a specific gift to the body of Christ. And so uh, the head cannot do what the hand can do. The hand cannot do what the foot can do. And so we are created for that purpose. And it kind of takes me back to Genesis where God is breathing life into man. I, now, I know half of us, maybe some of you can do this, but have you ever tried to breathe in and breathe out at the same time? Time. Now I know all of you just tried to do that and you're probably, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
it doesn't work. I guarantee you it doesn't work. But it said that God breathed life into man. And for that moment, we took God's breath away. Yes, we are breathless in the eyes of God. We have purpose because he's given us breath. So it's only right for us to give back what he so rightfully deserves. And so uh, with that, I'm just, I'm just reminded that get to know someone. Um, get to know their story. I just found out a couple weeks ago I'm part Norwegian, which is crazy. But, you know, so it's just, it's, you learn some crazy things each and every, every day. Very good. Very good. Well, as much as we, we, we're leaning into this discussion, uh, and, and the, the subject matter is intentional reconciliation. And, and, and as the church, I believe as the church goes, the world will go. And we're going to lead the charge in this conversation but we have a starting point. So as this is our starting point, we're realizing there's still some very serious, problematic cultural differences, some very underlying and overt still, let's, let's be honest, um, things that keep presenting themselves. But let me say it like this. As the church, Big C, how have we missed it? How have we fallen short in this area of leading the charge in, in, in leading towards reconciliation in this regard? I can say, um, you know, it's a conversation of, when you bring that conversation up, you know, it's not finished. You know, right. you have to, you know, talk about it, you know, and as you talk about it, right, you can finish the conversation. And it leads back to a marriage, you know, if you and your wife, right, is having a conversation and one depart, right, the conversation is not done. So what we have to do, right? We have to finish the conversation, you know? The scar is still there, you know? But we have to finish that. That's in the church, you know? Just don't leave it undone, you know? Because then when you go back to it, it's still there, right? But we have to reach out to each other, right? And finish that conversation, not just walk away from it. I heard one friend um, talk about it in the context of handedness that, that uh, uh, this world is, is created for right-handed people. You know, your desks, the orientation of everything is, is ultimately oriented to a handedness. And he called this right privilege, which I thought was funny. You should too. Thank you, somebody. But it's not. It is, but it's not. And, 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 I, and I'm not trying to uh, create simplicity to the depth of this conversation. But I'm just saying if, if, if maybe it's even living in a world created for two armed people and you have one arm, you know, Dr. King said something, it's cruel to, to say to a bootless man, pick yourself up by your bootstraps. He says when, when, when there was freedom for, for friends of, well, black, African-American friends, he said at one point freedom and famine were coexisting. And so in this life, we realize that there's some limitations. There's some liberties that every single ethnicity is afforded, but there's some limitations. And I've heard too many friends say something like this. Well, you know, ignorance is bliss. And we live under that, guys. But what I would say as the body of Christ is, if my ignorance is bliss, but that's my brother or sister's burden then I need to understand the narrative of God, that I'm to bear my burdens one to another, that I'm not afforded the liberty to just live under this bliss, but I need to get engaged and understand. Now, as a, I have friends in my world, trusted truth tellers. Anybody have trusted truth tellers that you can go to and you can talk and ask stupid questions and they won't? You know, the crazy thing about the truth is there's nothing brutal about honesty. But yet, when we get to the point where we're starting to package our truth, we usually come in the forward form of beating someone with it. And so because of that, certain people lean back, other people overtly lean in. How can we come to the table of discussion and continue to keep this conversation going forward so we can be informed and not live in a state of ignorance? Anyone care to share or weigh in on that? How do we keep the conversation going forward as the church. Pastor, may I? Microphone, uh, microphone. Again, may I <laughs> raise my hand again? Yes. Everyone raise up your hand with four fingers. I have to give you this illustration mm. because it bridges so many gaps. 
so many gaps. Four men, four women got off of Noah's boat. Four, eight people. Look at the person next to you. Which one are they of the eight? They're your related. They're, you're related. You are related. I'm related. I may be ugly, but I ain't. <laughs> I ain't. You ain't ugly. I mean, yeah. you know, whatever, you know. What you see is what you get. <laughs> I want you to know that that's what it is in God's eyes. Right. Every last one of you, he saved, salvaged, purposely. So he had a design for you. That person next to you is just as vital as your eyebrow is to your toenail. Okay, just as vital. Look at it like that bridge is so many gaps. You'll stop looking at things, people, differently when you know you're related to what you're looking at. Yes, very good. Very good. Anyone else? And I would just, um, upon what Brother Bill is saying, um, just being in this panel and, and you know, having this discussion, I think one of the starting points is that as the body of Christ, you know, you are a part of me and I am a part of you. Yeah. And I think that changes the narrative when you look at somebody and you're like, man, we are the body and we are together and we're actually a part of each other. And so I think that, you know, one of the, I guess, underlying tones of racism is that we're separated. We have nothing in common. We're different. But as the body of Christ, knowing that we are together and that one day we're going to be in heaven together. And so in spirit, and so there is no, not going to be any race, any skin color, any difference. But right now, you know, just having that knowledge that we are a part of each other. And so when you start the conversation, not that we're two separate people, but that we're already a part of the body. And so I would say that. Marquis, weigh in on this. Why would a multi-ethnic friend stay engaged in the conversation in the face of so much ignorance? and offense and, and, and constant underlying tension and really systemic issues, racism, why, why would a friend stay in? A multi-ethnic friend would, would stay in this conversation and um, because the, the perspective on the other side is, is being supported with their own information, their own facts, their own experiences. And I just think about defenses have to come down Right, defenses have to come down. It just, it, it's gotta be a vulnerable place. Vulnerable, it, it's gotta be a, from a vulnerable place. Cause I just think about the, the most racist people that I've come across. I mean, and this may be radical, but I think I can't really blame that person 100% for being racist because they grew up with their own experience, their right, own perspective, right. their own, right. the way that they were raised, the way that their parents talked to them, the way that their friends talked to them in their personal friend group. And I think that sometimes I think we get so offended that we don't want to have the conversation anymore. But I would say the reason that you're going to want to lean in is because people are going to, if, if we do our jobs as Christ followers mm -hmm. and we're spreading our love, we're mm -hmm. spreading the truth, mm -hmm. um, then guess people are going to wake up to this fact and realize that we need to have this conversation. And if we're not leaning in and ready to receive that conversation and with our defenses down and getting rid of our preconceived ideas or assumptions of what other people are saying and not get offended by the perspective that they truly have, then I think that when we lean in, the, we're gonna change this thing. Yeah. We're gonna Amen. change it. Amen. You know, this isn't anything new. You know, I was a part of the central staff a few years ago and we, we had done some panels and, and some discussions. So we, we wanna keep the conversation going. But I had a friend uh, as a part of this panel they were uh, African-American friend, and, and they were part of the panel, got done with the weekend gatherings, went home, went to, the, went to the grocery store the next day. They were standing in line in the grocery store, putting their food on the conveyor belt. I always go through the self-checkout. That's a lie. My wife does. I always want to make a new friend, so I go to the checker. What's up? And, but they were putting their food on the conveyor belt, and the, and the friend in front of them was checking out, and they look back and they say, hey, I know you. And, and my friend extends their hand, hey, what's your name? He goes, I'm not shaking your hand. And he goes, come again, Caucasian man, African American man. And he goes, you were on that panel. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you said I was privileged. And he said, well, I chose my words. I was on the panel. I did not say those words. Someone on the panel did. 
But let me say it like this. Have you ever went to bed at night thinking about the color of your skin? And then in the morning to wake up and be reminded again that that was your reality because of the world that you lived in. And the friend goes, no. And he said, that's a privilege. And there was a day in my life where I grew up in a context in a community that I went to bed every night thinking about the color of my skin. And in the morning, I woke up knowing the world that I was going into. I had to be reminded of it. But I moved. And it didn't change when you are a multi-ethnic, multicultural person of color. And the narrative that we need to know and understand is that this is not a skin issue. This is a sin issue. Yes. Yes. And the gospel is the answer. Yes. And we're not out here headhunting. Scriptural references all throughout the Bible will engage this conversation. Matthew 28, he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. He's not talking about physical land properties. He's talking about all people groups. I talked a few weeks ago about vision. I said Habakkuk climbed up to the watchtower to look to see what God would say to me is what it said. And I asked the question, why didn't it say that he would lean in to listen to hear? I said, because God speaks through word pictures more than the audible voice of God. And when we understand the the essential piece that we play in the great big picture of God. It doesn't matter how big or how small our piece is. If it's missing in the big picture of God's move and grace in this place, we're not whole. We're not who we're called to be. And so we're created in his image to be image bearers that we would continue to bear each other's burdens one to another because of his broken body on the cross and so we're going to receive communion together if you didn't get a cup just raise raise your hand there's some friends that'll get you a communion cup but we're going to go ahead and distribute these elements and receive the body of christ together and we have a a loaf here and you have a little wafer it's because we're up here and you're down there i don't know you better not. <laughs> and this is his body that was broken for us. And the beauty of this symbolism here is that we would see that we all take from the same body, the same bread, the same burdens that he bore on the cross was for each and every one of us that in Christ Jesus we are one and no longer is there Jew nor Gentile slave or free male or female we are all one in him and as we remember the work of Christ on the cross we remember because he gave we receive there's a portion of scripture where it talks about Jesus fed the 5,000. He took a couple bags of wonder, a few fish sticks. He started to hand them out. He says that he fed 5,000 men, not counting women and children. And there wasn't birth control back then, so you do the math. But he says that he took, he blessed, He broke and he gave. And everything he takes, he blesses. And everything he blesses, he breaks. And everything he breaks, he gives. And until we understand how broken we are outside of him, we will never understand all that he gave and the invitation in which he has extended so graciously. And we are one body in Christ Jesus. And we take this in remembrance of him. Hold it up if you would. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your broken body. You took on the cross what we never could. And this conversation is not a skin issue. This is a sin issue. And now we know we are one in Christ. There is no longer any condemnation. 
but there is no longer any separation because of your coming. Let us take. And the juice, symbolic of Jesus' blood, the thing that would seemingly stain us, color us, is the very thing that cleanses us. And we never want to take away any distinct beauty of the expression of the image of God that you and I were created in. Because Jesus made us all one in him. And it's beautiful to see the expression in various means. Because then I can lean in and learn that the Holy Spirit would correct and encourage but he also places people around me to continue to remind me of the call, to help me understand what it's like to live in this life through someone else's lens, that I would learn the character of God through different carriers of this same blood. And so as we take this, we remember this is the grace of Jesus Christ that he pours out and covers us all. Will you hold it up? Jesus, thank you for your blood poured out for us. You atoned for our sin, the separation that brought reconciliation back to you so that we could bring it to others. Let us be reminded of what you did and continue to go forward and do it ourselves in Jesus' name. Come on, let's drink. We want to conclude this time of gathering, but before we are sent, we don't go Going is lacking purpose, lacking a direct aim. We are sent in his mission. And as we are sent on our way, there's one uh, question we want to leave, hopefully to continue to cultivate in us a, a thought, a willingness to engage. And the question is this, how do our differences actually create opportunity for unity. How do our differences actually create opportunity for unity? I would say keep this as a discussion point in your family. Keep this as a discussion point in front of yourself. Help cultivate and create conversations that will continue to allow the church to be the church and to respond to the invitation of Jesus Christ to come and follow me, to live offense free, to live forgiven, to live engaged in reconciliation of all faces and races in all places by the glory of God's grace. He would continue to move in us. Amen. And so I want to invite us as a church, and some of you are germaphobes, and let me just say, if you don't like people, you're going to hate heaven. But we're going to stand, I'm going to invite you to stand, and we're going to stand together, and we're going to pray a couple powerful prayers. And the prayer that I'm going to pray is a prayer of repentance. I'm going to pray a prayer that we would repent, not of the wrongdoing. I, I believe we've prayed many prayers of the wrongdoing. I would pray a prayer of our unawareness of the reality of this issue that we would continue to allow God to lead us in this conversation. Amen. And so that's my posture in prayer. And then I would ask Barryman, would you pray a prayer of reconciliation? We're not where we could be, but we're not where we should be. That we'll continue to lead as the bride of Christ with love and grace and allow God to continue to use us to lead us all to this place of reconciliation. Yeah. Yes. Come on, let's hold hands yes. if you would. Can Bridge the aisles and the gaps. Yes. Gracious Father, thank you, Jesus. we just give you all the glory, honor, and praise. Father God, as we gather together, Father God, in holding hands, Father God, unto you, Father God, to bring a change, Father God, to bring, Father God, closeness, Father God, without, Father God, any blemishes, Father God. Lord, we ask asking you to allow us, Father God, to come together as unity, Father God, as we are right now. Father God, moving 
all hatefulness, Father God, from our hearts, Father God. Removing ignorance, Father God, it's gone right now, Father God. Removing uh, uh, the bigotry right now, Father God, it's gone right now in the name of Jesus. Father God, we claim victory right now, and we say this thing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And Jesus, we thank you for this place that we can lift up one voice. Absolutely, we praise you for that. And unity is not uniformity. We don't have to look like, sound like, come from the same places to be one in Christ. And we thank you that we get to come into this place and express our worship to you. That God, this would look like heaven on earth. Because when we get there, it's going to look like this. More beautiful, more diversified, broader, beyond our wildest imaginations. But God, we stand in a place and a posture of repentance. God, where we've missed it, forgive us, but give us wisdom. God, let us not live in this place of ignorance is bliss, but let us bear our burdens one to another, that my brother and my sister and the burdens that they bear would no longer bear alone, that we would lean in with love and say, let me carry the cross of Christ in my life as I walk with the brother and friend next to me doing the same. And we would answer the question, as Cain tried to deflect, am I brother? Am I my brother's keeper? Absolutely. No doubt. Who is my neighbor? That you commanded us to love God and love people. And we will do that with a listening ear and a willingness to learn. Lead us. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you now in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Come on, let's applaud and thank him in this place.